This is Malik Hook from the University of Colorado, and I'll be talking about new drugs in the pipeline. These are my disclosures. Learning objectives include a discussion of new topical medication treatments for glaucoma and how these new options influence current practice patterns. The most common algorithm for treating glaucoma includes a prostaglandin analog as first-line therapy. This is usually followed by a sequence of beta blockers or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors along with some of the fixed combinations that are available globally and alpha agonists. Rarely we move to pilocarpine or oral carbonic anhydrase inhibitors usually as a temporizing measure before we move to other therapeutics like laser and surgery. And the question for today is what do we do now with some of the new therapeutics that are available around the world? The three medications that I'll be discussing include latanoprostine benoid, also known as Visalta, natarsidil, also known as Repressa, and the combination medication natarsidil latanoprost, also known as Roclatan. Latanoprostine benoid acts by releasing two active ingredients upon topical installation. This includes latanoprost acid and nitric oxide. The mechanism of IOP lowering is twofold. There is an increase through the non-conventional outflow pathway or uveoscleral pathway that's mediated by FP receptors. This is the latanoprost arm of the action. And the second mediator of IOP lowering is nitric oxide, which increases outflow through the conventional outflow pathway. The Apollo and Lunar studies looked at the efficacy of latanoprostium bonode versus timolol 0.5%, and the primary endpoint was IOP lowering at nine different assessment time points. What the two studies found was uh, latanoprostium bonode was non-inferior to timolol in both studies and demonstrated significantly greater IOP lowering over timolol at all but one time point in the two studies. From a side effect standpoint or an adverse event standpoint, these were relatively minor with conjunctival hyperemia at 6% and then lower percentages of eye irritation, pain, and installation site pain. The discontinuation rate was relatively minor. When do we use latanoprostium benoid? It's very similar to prostaglandin analogs in our practice. We use it as initial therapy. We use it in patients who might have had failure or intolerance to other prostaglandin analogs and we use it as adjunctive therapy similar to the PGA practice. Obstacles to use include insurance coverage, which is getting better every day, clinician habit, we're accustomed to prescribing some of the available prostaglandin analogs that are on the market as primary therapy, and also the generic latanoprost that are on the market, which um, are much easier for some of our patients to obtain from pharmacies and creates a barrier to prescribing some of the new therapeutics. Natarsidil or Ropressa is the second medication, not to be undone by Visalta, which has two mechanisms of action. Natarsidil has three mechanisms of action. It relaxes trabecula meshwork, which increases outflow, it lowers episcleral venous pressure, and it reduces fluid production. The ROCKET studies, ROCKET 1, 2, and 4, looked at the efficacy of Natarsidil versus Timolol 0.5% BID at nine different time points. Once daily natarsidil was found to be non-inferior to twice daily timolol at all nine time points through month three. You can always return to this page and just pause it to look at the specific data, but this is a pooled data set with pressure under 25. And you can see the comparison here with the non-inferiority to timolol. The story of natarsidil really centers around the ocular safety profile, which has been discussed heavily within glaucoma circles. You can see here that conjunctival hyperemia of natarsidil is relatively high compared to that of timolol, and there's some unique adverse events like cornea verticillata, as well as petechial hemorrhages that occur, and I'll show you some pictures of that here in subsequent slides. In a study that we published, this is the ROCKET2 study, uh, looking specifically at the adverse events, you can see the conjunctival hyperemia of natarsidil, either QD or BID, was relatively high compared to timolol. The cornea verticillata was as high as 25% in both the QD and BID um, arms of the study. And um, the visual acuity reduction was notable with 8.8% and 8.7% with the QD and BID dosing. Cornea verticillata is a unique side effect of this ROC inhibitor. The onset time is usually around 172 days or so with resolution stabilization after 341 days post discontinuation. Question here is, does this have any effect on the vision? And we really don't have a great handle on this in the real world. 
some of the studies that were done post hoc looking at the data shows that the verticillata doesn't have a one-to-one -one effect on the visual acuity, but we have to keep an eye on this in real world practice and see what kind of effect this might have on the vision. The appearance is different from verticillata that can occur with other classes of medications. In this case, you can see the pigmentation that the green arrow is pointing to. In the posterior margin here, this is pigment dispersion glaucoma with the typical Krukenberg spindle that you see with a black arrow. And this is just to give you an idea that the verticillata in the case with uh, Ropressa or Notarsidil is pigmented. It looks different than some of the other verticillatas that we see, again, with other classes of medication. Perilimbal petechia is also a unique um, adverse event that happens with Ropressa. These are usually noted by the patient coming in and telling the physician that they're occurring. So it, it is noticed by the patient, it's not subtle. Fortunately, these universally go away, and when they do go away, there's a tendency for them not to recur over and over again. The patient-centered discussion is really important with nutarsidil. What I usually tell the patients is that it is effective as once daily medication to lower IOP. The adverse events can be significant, especially compared to other classes, with hyperemia being the most prominent. Cornea verticillata may occur, and our understanding of the pathogenesis is still evolving. In my experience, it happens in 100% of the patients. Transient subconjunctival petechial hemorrhages, these are usually perilimbal, do occur, but they tend to go away and tend not to recur. The drop in visual acuity is more prominent compared to beta blockers, and we still don't understand exactly why that is. It doesn't seem to be related one-to-one -one with the verticillata that occurs. When to use for patients with pretreatment pressure of 25 or as monotherapy in patients who have concerns about the ocular side effects of PGAs, are intolerant to or have inadequate efficacy with PGAs, or need or prefer alternative to beta blockers, alpha agonists, or carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. As an adjunct agent, you can add to a PGA prior to laser or surgery to see if you can maybe delay the onset of laser or surgical treatments. You can add it to other adjunctive agents prior to laser or surgery. So you can really go PGA, one of the other medication classes like alpha agonists, CAIs, beta blockers, and then add on atarsidil if you're trying to push away laser or surgery. For the last class of medications that we'll talk about here, this is a combination natarsidil latanoprost. The Mercury 1, Mercury 2 study looked at natarsidil 0.02% and latanoprost 0.005% versus the two components of natarsidil and latanoprost. The efficacy time points is what we're used to looking at, uh, nine different time points. And of course, the safety profile of the medication was looked at during the three month treatment period. Natarsidil and latanoprost fixed dose combination achieves statistical superiority over individual components at all time points over the three months. You can pause this slide and take a look at the comparison, but basically what we're seeing here is a lowering of IOP by an additional 1.4 to 3.2 millimeters of mercury versus the individual components. Again, the story here is the adverse events that occur with natarsidil latanoprost fixed dose combination. If you go back to the natarsidil slide, you'll see that these are very similar with conjunctival hyperemia, cornea verticillata, conjunctival hemorrhages, again, very similar to what we saw with Repressa or natarsidil alone. Patient-centered discussion, I speak about this as a unique combination drop to treat open angle glaucoma and ocular hypertension. It has the same adverse event profile of Repressa, so that discussion is similar to what I, what I talk about for Repressa. And this has more IOP lowering compared to generic latanoprost, so there is that added advantage of talking about the superiority from an IOP lowering standpoint, which can help us overcome some of the hesitancy that we have for the ocular um, side effects that we've discussed over the last couple of classes of medications here. When to use when you need slightly more IOP lowering versus a PGA alone in place of adding a second drop to an existing prostaglandin analog, and then prior to laser or surgery, similar to the discussion that we had for Ropressa or Notarsidil standalone. How has my practice changed? Well, I love having more options. It's great to have different classes of medications to use and to give me more mix and match opportunity. Latanoprostine Benoid prior to adding a second drop or laser in motivated patients, although coverage is still an issue and this is getting better every day. Ropressa and Roclitan are reserved for patients who are highly motivated to avoid surgery or as a temporizing measure prior to surgery. 
The same coverage issues that come up with any new medication come up with a repress and rocklatan. Latanoprost is still dominant in my practice. This is still the go-to medication for primary therapy, and I go to the others for the examples that I stated previously. SLT utilization is increasing due to cost and adverse event of medication, so we always have to keep this in mind when we're talking about practices changing with different medications. SLT more and more is coming into view, especially with the recent publication of the LIGHT trial and the findings that they reported. Focus on drug delivery as the possible next inflection point. I think a lot of our discussions and a lot of the talks are going to center around things like Darista and some of the newer drug delivery platforms that are coming to market. Thank you very much.